So to review from where we left off last class, uh, we're finding the electric field at a distance d above a disk or sheet of charge. And in this case, we're using a disk of radius r, and we're going to be above its center by a distance d. And so that's um, <clears throat> the picture that we have at the top uh, that we had in class last time. And uh, we're going to break that disk into rings because we know the electric field of the ring at a distance d from the center of the ring um, that we had written down in class previously, and we'll write it down again soon. Uh, but before we get there, let's see how to break this disk up into rings. Uh, again, we're still reviewing from last class. We're going to say that the disk or the sheet of charge, the um, uh, the two-dimensional surface of charge has a charge per unit area of Q over A. That's this first equation, sigma equals Q over A, and the area of that disk is pi r squared. So we'll break that disk into rings, so now we get into this brown area here, um, and each ring has a radius r and a thickness dr and a charge dq, such that when we add up all the dqs, that'll equal the Q of the disk. Um, and we can figure out that the area of the ring the area of the ring is the circumference of the ring times the thickness it's just a rectangle that is bent into a circle 2 pi r dr uh, so then we can write the charge density of that ring is again charge over area Oops, that crosses it out. That didn't look good. But anyway, charge over area. Um, and so it's dq over dA. And so we plug in dq and dA, and we get that the charge per unit area is dq over 2 pi r dr, which is also equal to right, q over pi r squared. Okay. We can just leave this in terms of sigma, it's easier to do that uh, to allow us to go from a disk, because what we're going to do is go from a finite disk to an infinite disk. So we can just leave it in terms of sigma, the charge per unit area. Um, we could always plug in the what the charge per unit area is, but I'm just going to take this last equation and solve for dq. So that dq is equal to 2 pi r dr times this constant sigma. Now remember that the electric field due to a ring of charge we just figured out is, it is as shown, the electric field of a ring of charge Q uh, and radius R at a distance D from the center. We figured out was this, but now this ring is uh, has charge DQ and it's just DE um, due to one ring and we'll add up all the rings. So I'm just gonna rewrite DE is K D DQ over D squared plus R squared to three halves. <clears throat> so remember, we are taking a disk and breaking it up into rings. So we're gonna say that the field is made up of the sum of all the rings. So each ring has a field of DE. So I'm just going to take DQ of the ring and plug in the um, expression that we just <coughs> excuse me, the expression that we just figured out for dq, if we want to write it in terms of the charge density of the ring, remember, sigma is charge per unit area, the charge density of the, sorry, of the disk, um, so that's just plugging in dq, and then in order to find the electric field, we have to add up all the de's for all the different radiuses of those rings that go from a radius of zero to a radius of capital R the largest r. I guess I wasn't careful here about my r variables. I, um, we're going to vary r of the, of the ring from 0 to r, and that's why we are um, integrating from 0 to r. So I just went ahead and rewrote that integral, pulled out all the things that are constant, um, and left in all the things that are variables. Um, r is the only variable. We had to leave in d squared plus r squared because it's a term that has r in it. Um, and so now we need to do this integral. 
and you might say, how am I supposed to do that integral? And I question the same thing. How am I supposed to do that integral? Um, and if you're good at calculus two, you might remember various methods to solve it. Um, and if you're not, here's a hint. If you become a physics major, and especially if you go on to graduate school in physics, you're gonna need to be able to solve basic integrals like this, but you can always figure them out by plugging them into Wolfram Alpha. If you don't know about Wolfram Alpha, um, it's an online program which allows you to do a number of mathematical things quite easily just by plugging them into a box. So if you just go to wolframalpha.com, you can just type in integral of x over d squared plus x squared to the 1.5. I should replace x with r here because I know Wolfram Alpha recognizes x as the variable. Um, so I've just put in that integral. Uh, you don't have to tell Wolfram Alpha the dr or anything. Um, I think it'll uh, take it or leave it, but it knows what you mean by integral of x squared over d squared plus x squared to 1.5. And you can see it knows that because the next line, after I typed that, it has an expression where it's actually written the integral properly, and then it tells me the answer. So that's kind of cool. It certainly is a shortcut. Um, we could spend more time doing it in this class, but for now we won't. Um, and we have an answer for that integral. So I go ahead and plug that back into our expression for E, um, plug the integral in. The limits, remember, were 0 to R. We're integrating from a radius 0 to the radius, the maximum radius R, and we'll plug in those limits. So I plugged in the limits, um, R and 0, and so now I'm going to simplify. Remember that K is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So I'm going to use that and plug that in for k and then simplify the rest of it. So just a little bit of algebra um, and we get this expression. Not that interesting expression. We can look at the limits. Um, for example, if d is much, much larger than r, remember we talked about the fact that then the disk should look like a point and indeed it does. I'm not going to do that for you. It's not obvious. You have to um, you have to plug in uh, some, well, you have to do a little bit of algebra in order to show that. You can try that on your own, but you should get the point charge if d is much, much larger than r. The other interesting limit is what if d is much, much smaller than r? In other words, if we're close to the surface of the disk compared to the radius of the disk. This is similar to being close to the surface of the earth. Um, when we're close to the surface of the earth, we don't see the edges of the earth, and the earth looks flat. Uh, and infinite. So if you're close to the surface of the disk uh, compared to its radius, uh, it looks like an infinitely large disk. So we can actually do that by um, plugging by plugging in some limits for d much, much less than r. Uh, easiest to do that is to plug in r equals infinity. So it doesn't matter that it's um, a disk shape or something else. If we're close, we can't really see the shape, so I'm not going to go back to calling it a sheet of charge, just a two-dimensional sheet of charge. If we're close to the surface compared to its dimensions, or if it's infinitely large, we get sigma over 2 epsilon 0. That's the electric field due to a sheet of charge with charge density sigma. And that's going to be true for any sheet of charge, which is either, again, infinitely large or we're close to the surface compared to its dimensions. So this is an important result because it's, it's, it's going to be true when we're close to any um, when we're close to any charged object, if we're close, then it looks like a flat sheet. Just like, again, when you're close to the surface of the Earth, the gravitational field um, comes from the fact that it looks like it's a constant gravitational field. It looks like it's a, uh, it's a flat Earth. Um, it doesn't look round. It can't see the edges. And it does turn out to be a constant, right? So the, the electric field of a sheet of charge, an infinite sheet of charge, is sigma over 2 epsilon 0, where sigma is a constant and 2 is obviously a constant. Epsilon 0 is a constant. Remember that sigma is just the charge per unit area. 
um, and this is assuming that it is uniformly charged, just like the Earth has a uniform gravitational field um, close to the surface of the Earth. Uh, the sheet is uniformly charged. Now we've left off here, we've, we've sort of lost the fact that E is a vector, and remember that the um, electric field pointed away from the ring uh, perpendicularly, therefore away from the disk perpendicularly, therefore away from the sheet perpendicularly. And so we're going to have to add the direction, um, and now it's not a radial direction, because radially means um, along a radius from a point, now it's always per pointing perpendicularly from the sheet at any point, as long as, again, you're not close to the edge of the sheet. Uh, it's going to look like it's perpendicularly from the sheet, and that's the normal direction. The n hat means normal direction. n hat is normal direction. We know what normal means. It's the perpendicular direction to the sheet. Now remember that charge comes in two flavors, plus and minus. Um, and if you put a positive charge on a sheet, whether it's a conducting sheet, an insulating sheet, if you have a even charge, a uh, um, constant charge density across the sheet, um, and it's positive, then this is going to turn out to have a direction of positive n hat, uh, with a bunch of uh, numbers in front of it. But if it's negative, the direction is going to be negative n hat. So for a sheet of positive charge, the electric field is always pointing away and the lines are all parallel to each other. Remember, that means that it's constant. It doesn't get smaller as you get farther from the sheet. Now, in reality, when does it get smaller? It gets smaller when you get far enough away that you can see the edges. But we're assuming that you don't do that when we're talking about a sheet of charge. We're either talking about an infinite sheet or that you're close enough that you don't see the edges. So, we're, so the field lines are all parallel to each other again it doesn't get smaller as you get farther away, right? The Earth's gravitational field, until you get really far away, doesn't get any smaller. Acceleration due to gravity is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared, whether you're on the ground or whether you're at the top of a building, the Earth still looks flat. So the electric field due to an infinite sheet of charge is constant and doesn't get any smaller as you get farther away. So the electric field map, is a bunch of parallel lines. That's what we talked about in class the other day. I showed you an electric field map of parallel lines and told you that that could only come from an sh infinite sheet of charge. Now, so what would a negative sheet look like? What would the field map of a negative sheet look like? The electric field must point towards the sheet. And again, on both sides, whether we're above it or below it or to the left of it or the right of it, um, the electric field lines point towards the sheet because a positive test charge would move towards the sheet. Um, so an electric, uh, a, a, never mind, scratch what I was about to say. Uh, so this electric field magnitude of sigma over 2 epsilon 0, that's the electric field on either side of the sheet. That's important, right? That the electric field on top is sigma over 2 epsilon 0. The electric field on the bottom has a magnitude of sigma over 2 epsilon 0. Uh, same here, sigma has a magnitude of sigma over 2 epsilon 0, top, bottom, whoops, I forgot the subscripts, bottom, top, equals sigma over 2 epsilon 0. So the electric field on both sides of sigma over 2 epsilon 0. So speaking of sheep, oh, I guess we weren't speaking of sheep, we were speaking of sheet of charge. Anyway, speaking of sheep, uh, what do you call a sheep with no legs? A cloud. I don't really care if that wasn't funny. So now I've got a clicker question for you. <clears throat> don't really care that you don't have your clickers, but hey, let's do it anyway. Let's say that you have two sheets of charge, um, and one is positively charged and one is negatively charged. Let's say that they have the same charge density. Sigma is plus Q over uh, area for the top and sigma equals minus q over area for the bottom. Let's say that they have the same charge density. Um, what is the electric field? Wait, let me take that back. Uh, it's easier to talk about it this way. It's really the same thing, but just to say that the top sheet has a charge per unit area of sigma and the bottom sheet has a charge per unit area of minus sigma. Um, 
magnitude of the charge per unit area is Q over A, and one's positive and one's negative. So what is the electric field everywhere? What is E everywhere? And uh, remember, we're treating these like infinite sheets. I don't mean to the right or left when we get to their edges, but above, between, and below this sandwich. Uh, there's a space between them. Um, so what is the electric field everywhere? So I suggest that you pause the video at this point and choose one of the five answers below. So the answer is um, the first one, sigma over epsilon zero between, zero above and zero below. And let's see why. So remember if we have a plus sheet that the electric field below it should be constant, look like that. Electric field above it should be constant, look like that. Oops. And the electric field everywhere is sigma over 2 epsilon 0. This one is sigma over 2 epsilon 0. Now we're adding to that a second sheet. So we're going to have to add those fields together. Whoops, the second sheet is not positive, but minus. Um, we're going to have to add those fields together. Let me draw the minus um, sheets field in green. Above it, it points downwards. And it's constant. And below it, it points upwards. And it's constant. <clears throat> and so you can see that at least between it, whoops, I forgot to write down, and E due to that negative sheet has a magnitude of sigma over 2 epsilon 0. These are epsilon zeros. Um, e is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon 0. So between the two sheets, you can see that a field of magnitude sigma over 2 epsilon 0 pointing down from the plus sheet adds to a field of sigma over 2 epsilon 0 pointing down from the minus sheet and so that the total field between E between two sheets is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon 0 plus sigma over 2 epsilon 0, which is sigma over epsilon 0. And then above and below the plus minus sandwich, Right, so really, in order to show this, we need to extend these vectors because remember, this field is constant no matter how far away we get. So let me extend these minus vectors up, right? And so they're pointing downward above the plus sheet, and they still have a magnitude of sigma over 2 epsilon 0. So E to the negative field has a magnitude of sigma over 2 epsilon 0 above the plus sheet, the plus sheet has a fixed field of sigma over 2 epsilon 0 there also, but now they're pointing in the opposite directions. So, sigma over 2 epsilon 0 minus sigma over 2 epsilon 0, because they point in opposite directions, equals 0. And by the same argument, E below equals 0. So, a sandwich of a plus minus sheet, infinite sheet, large sheet, right? We don't, we don't really have to make it infinite. They're large compared to their um, separation, maybe. Um, well, that's, yeah. So if we're talking about two sheets near each other, as long as they're large compared to the separation, then when you're between them, the electric field is constant sigma over epsilon zero, right? Because it adds um, and then is approximately zero above and below. I only say approximately because that's in the real world um, when the sheets actually have edges, uh, but it is zero above and below. Uh, so this is a way to have a, co a, a contained constant field. We can have a contained constant field by putting a sandwich of a plus and a minus. And this is a very, very standard uh, scientific piece of equipment. Uh, if we want to have a constant controllable field, 
Um, therefore, we can exert a constant controllable force on electric charges. We just have a sandwich or uh, two sheets, two metal um, sheets that are near each other. Um, we put them close to each other uh, and, uh, and we charge them with opposite charges. Or you can think about what would happen if they had the same charge. Um, let me give you a hint. If they had the same charge, the field in between would be zero, but what would be the field above and below? Uh-huh. Um, anyway, so let's take the opposite charge. And, uh, and so now we have, we can control the size of the field by controlling the amount of charge on the sheets. Um, and, uh, therefore we can have a constant controllable field. So this apparatus of, uh, two, uh, metal sheets that are near each other that have opposite charge. The way you put, put uh, easily put opposite charge on them is simply to put a voltage across them, right? A voltage is a battery or a power supply. Um, put a voltage across them, and that gives them um, opposite charge. And then, uh, so we can control the amount of field or force by changing the voltage. We'll certainly talk about that in a later chapter, but we had now have a constant field. This is is such a common piece of apparatus. It's in a cathode ray tube. It's in old televisions. It's in oscilloscopes. Um, it's in a whole bunch of scientific equipment. But in particular, where uh, where you have perhaps used it before is in the old CRT televisions, the the tube televisions. But of course, these days we mostly have flat screen LCD or LED TVs. But in the old televisions, this was used to direct the um, electrons, which made the TV picture. Um, so you could actually uh, use it to uh, deflect an electron and, and make it go to a certain place. So this is an example of a, let's say, a cathode ray tube, um, which is where we create electrons. We give them a velocity, a speed, V. We send them between two charged plates plates with voltage on them. Um, and depending on the voltage, that electron is going to be deflected, right? It's going to be pushed away from the minus and towards the plus. And we can easily control it because we know it's a constant field. And so it's, uh, it's uh, easy to predict the path of the electron. Um, and then we can therefore aim the electron at a particular place on a screen. And when it hits the screen in a cathode ray tube, it actually lights up the screen at the point that it hits. Um, and if you send electrons in really fast and you aim them, you can change where they hit really fast. Um, and then you do this both in the up-down direction and the left-right direction. So I didn't give myself enough space. But there we go. Okay, so then we, ha we can aim them up and down, left and right, and we can hit anywhere on the screen. Um, and we can make an image on the screen that way by having the electrons hit the screen and make the screen light up um, in a particular order, in a particular way. That's called a cathode ray tube, or CRT. And it's the way old televisions, the tube televisions, the big ones, used to work. So let's see how you can predict that deflection. Um, remember that the electric field between two sheets is sigma over epsilon zero. And the force on a charge Q, let's say it's an electron with a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, or any other charge that we send through those two sheets, the force is going to be Q times E, because remember, by definition, E is force per unit charge. Um, and so the force is Q sigma over epsilon zero. I should have drawn a picture first. Um, so we're taking a plus sheet and a minus sheet, and we're sending a charge Q through at some speed V. Um, and if it was not being deflected, it would go straight through. And let's say that we want to know how much is going to be deflected in, let's say, the Y direction, because if we call that the Y direction, um, Notice that I haven't been paying attention to directions because we know the electric field direction between uh, the two sheets uh, goes from plus to minus. The electric field direction goes like that. So it'll push a, po push a positive charge in the downward direction. So we could go ahead and put um, minus y hat on this 
but you know, if it was the other way around, if the minus was on the top and the plus was on the bottom, then it would be plus y hat. Uh, we just know that it, that it will push a charge in the direction of the field lines and push a positive charge from uh, the plus plate to the minus plate. So in any case, if the um, if there's a constant force on a charge Q, we know that F equals ma, F equals ma. So therefore, Q sigma over epsilon zero equals m a, where m is the mass of the charge. So this thing, this thing here, has a charge Q and a mass m, um, and so therefore the acceleration is Q sigma over epsilon zero uh, over m. And so we know the acceleration, and it's a constant acceleration, right? Look at that. It's constant acceleration because these are all constants. Um, so this is no different than projectile motion. It's throwing a ball at the surface of the Earth. It's projectile motion. We know the constant acceleration. Uh, if we throw something sideways at the speed v, um, you know how far down does it go uh, in a certain time or in a certain distance or before? It, how long does it take to hit the ground? Whatever we can ask all kinds of questions like that. Um, but if we're talking about how much deflection does it get um, uh, in the time that it's within the plates? So let's just go ahead and, and solve this just a little further. Um, it matters. We want to know what the deflection is while it's between the plates. So that means we need to know, um, because this is acceleration, and we want to know delta y, which is 1 half at squared, right? Plus v zero t, but in the y direction, right, that's v zero y. Uh, the initial velocity is zero, so we need to know the time, how long it takes. Well, how long does it take to get between those plates? Well, we need to know a little bit more information. We need to know how far, how wide the plates are, how how much distance it passes, and let's call that l. Now, if it's going speed v in the x direction, and distance l, then what is the time t? t equals, this is all kinematics, it's from chapter 2, maybe it's chapter 3, I don't know, uh, t is equal to l over v, right? Distance equals rate times time. <clears throat> so therefore, delta y equals 1 half a, which is in the box, uh, times t squared. And we can figure out the deflection in the y direction. And we can see that we can change that deflection um, if everything is a constant. If this, if you th again think about a cathode ray tube, uh, a physical apparatus where we're sending in charges with a fixed charge and a fixed mass, the metal plates, we can't change their size, L is constant. Um, then the only, only thing we can change is the charge on the plates. And so we can change the deflection, delta y, by changing the deflection, right, which is this here, um, the sigma, by changing the, the charge. Sorry, we can change the deflection, delta y, by changing the charge on the plates, which is sigma. And that's just by changing the voltage, uh, which, again, we'll see in a later chapter. So... When you see problems like this on homework or in the book, right? What what we're doing is, remember, this is this is the key here, is that we're talking about we've got a constant force because we've got a constant field, and that constant force is Q times E, um, and then it's all kinematics from there. F equals m a, and delta y equals one half a t squared. Um, t, you know, it's all kinematics. That's all kinematics. Well, F equals ma isn't kinematics. That's Newton's second law. Um, we use that to find the acceleration. Then it's all kinematics from there to figure out how long it takes a charge to move a certain distance between the plates or something like that. So these are the basic equations that you'll use for those constant field problems.
Here's another matchstick puzzle. So you need to move one matchstick, assuming that these are all made of matchsticks, uh, in order to create another correct equation. Not a terribly difficult question, but a fun one nonetheless.